Here's a quick background. My name is John, CEO and co-founder of Space Aid Games. Uh, with regard to my knowledge of, of influencers and YouTube, I'd summarize it by the screen here. I play a tuber simulator. I kind of get it. I get the feeling it's a lot deeper than this. In other words, I don't know a whole lot. Fortunately, there are a lot of people in the company, certainly my co-founder Simon, who do understand this very well. Uh, and I hope to reach out to you a lot. So if you are going to listen to me for advice on how to do your job better, I have no idea. Uh, and I really respect how good you've gotten at it. That said, I know a little bit about making games. There are a lot of similarities between what I do and what you do. Our language is a little different. The numbers I'm going to talk to you about might be slightly different than the ones that you measure. But if you listen carefully, I think you're going to hear a whole lot about your business reflected back from my experiences and mine. And the reason I'm here is to help you learn a few things from my world, from our world, about how to spot the next big hit game. Uh, why that's topical is because that's exactly what Space Ape and I think the other companies here as well have been trying to do with our careers. Certainly we're no experts at it, but we think about it long and hard. Our mission as a company is to find that next genre finding game, the next top 10 wanted to do it in the next two years. And I wrote this about six months ago, so the clock is ticking. And so I imagine you're trying to find that game on your side of your business, and we're trying to make it on our side. And so I thought to give you a few tips, I would first give you a brief history of where and how mobile games have come to be, because there's some things to be learned in that history, things to repeat, things to avoid, most of all I think some bad lessons that perhaps some of us have picked up. So first of all, there's the first generation of free-to-play mobile games on iPhones, uh, on Androids. Let's call it the pioneer era. This is a land rush. This is true of almost every industry. The idea is a new thing opens up and innovative, risk-taking people flood the market. And so in gaming, this started taking place in mobile around 2009, sort of crescendoed in 2011. A very quick two-year period following the rise of social games on Facebook, which I and many people at Space Age were part of. This is a chart. Uh, this is dated October 20, 2010. These are grossing charts. I'm not going to linger on this too long, but what you'll see is a hodgepodge of strategies. You'll see paid games, free games. You'll see big brands and little ones. You'll see a couple companies like Stormate and Zynga in particular really running the charts. What you won't see here are companies that were born and raised to make mobile free-to-play games. You'll see a lot of people who saw an opportunity and quickly moved in. And those guys gave way to what we like to think of as a second generation of games around about 2011 and 2012. They laid the groundwork for us. Uh, first of all, the platform got better. There was a time not long ago, if you remember, where the App Store didn't allow in-app purchases. There was a time shortly before that, in 2008, where there was no App Store. And as all these things, these necessary ingredients for our business fell into place and as the installed base started growing, uh, there became opportunity for a business. The fundamental difference in all walks of life between a pioneer and a colonist is that a colonist comes to stay. A pioneer is a speculator. Uh, they show up when they see a buck to be made. They make that buck. They often succeed or die, but they certainly give way to the colonists. And the colonists build their professions on the bodies of the pioneers. And that's what the second generation is. If I had to summarize, it goes like this. You're going to see a little recurring story here. But basically, it's the first to quality, or as Apple likes to call it, the second mover advantage. Again, very typical in tech. The idea is it's not the first person that wins. It's the second person who's smart enough to figure out what the first person did. So you recognize these games, Subway Surfers. It's Temple Run plus quality. And if you ask the guy that found it, he'll literally tell you that. Candy Crush Saga, the jewel plus quality. Clash of Clans. Galaxy Life plus quality. Again, I summarize, but I only have 15 minutes. Lastly, and maybe most controversially, <laughs> Game of War. <laughs> Kingdoms of Camelot plus quality. Now, there's two things I want to highlight about this company in particular. First is many people in my profession, although I don't know about yours, uh, really don't like when I say something like Game of War is a high quality game. Because in games development, we look at things like graphics and production values and polish as measures of quality. Uh, and what I'd submit to you, the quality is not defined by us, the game developer, and it's frankly not defined by you as the influencer. Quality is defined by the player. Uh, and we have measurements at the end of the day to figure out if players really like these games. We look at how long they play for, how much money they spend on them, how much uh, they engage with them. And by any honest measurement of quality, you have to admit that this is a high quality game. Not for the reasons that we normally look to, but instead for the reasons that were valuable to players. You didn't actually want a high production value experience. They wanted an experience that was on mobile, but kind of like the browser games that they used to play in the mid-2000s. And these guys did. The second point I want to make to you is that these games, Game of War, didn't replace Kingdoms of Camelot and so forth with the examples before. Those old games didn't go away. 
they just added a zero to the amount of money they make. So whereas in 2010, the number one grossing on the app store maybe made $100,000 a day, in 2015, they might still be making $100,000 a day, but somebody's learned how to make $5 million a day. So they layered on top. And these guys fell behind. And so that sort of sets the context to where I think many people think we are today. Let's call it the mature era, question mark, depending on your pessimism or your optimism level. This starts around 2012. It certainly hasn't finished. And I think you could summarize this market as first come, first serve. It it's, appears as though the winners are doing all the taking. And the reason you would be pessimistic is you would say these things. First, players have a lot more choice than they did before, so it's harder for them to find your game. It's more expensive to get the paid ones not just because all the other gaming companies are trying to buy users, but even more importantly because Amazon has learned that they can advertise on Facebook very effectively, and big brands, car companies, tech companies, you name it. Guys who don't even care really about attribution of revenue, they're also buying our channels. And so the costs are going up even as it's getting harder to find free users. And lastly, these incumbents have built up brands. You've heard of Candy Crush, you've heard of King. So when King launches a game or when Candy Crush creates a new game, probably going to play it, so it's getting harder and harder. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, there's some reason for optimism. First of all, this, I'm not going to go into depth, but it basically shows the market growing. These are projections, so who knows, but I believe it. So it says two things. One, the total absolute market for games is growing from maybe a 80 or 90 billion business a year ago to something like 120 billion business by the end of the decade. And furthermore, that growth is consolidated in mobile, nowhere else. If you cut this a little bit deeper, you'll see a lot of this growth is in Asia. So you've got this phenomenon toward Asia as a market and a phenomenon toward mobile as a platform. So there's a lot of good in here. Usually uh, declining businesses have the opposite. You, you see the pie shrinking every year on growth. So I choose to view things differently. I, I choose to be optimistic. I wouldn't be standing here uh, if I weren't an optimist. But I think that actually the third generation of games is, is going to be a generation of innovators. Uh, and, and the reason I do is because I look at the things that I believe and that Space Ape believes are fundamental to making a good game. Uh, being innovative, being a humble learner, taking chances, some things I'm about to go through in a minute. And in most cases, I don't see those behaviors in the big companies. There are a few, one or two in particular, of the larger game companies that I really admire. So I'm not going to set a blanket rule. But in general, the sorts of things that make you good in mobile gaming then cause you to get big, which then cause you to be not so good in mobile gaming. So I speculate that just as we saw a layer of pioneers give way to colonists, that we're going to see a, a wave of innovators maybe not do away with the big companies. They're not going anywhere. They're going to continue making lots of money, but maybe comprise the growth that we should expect to see in the next few years. So some things that I would highlight. Players are tired of the same stuff. That's a reason to believe. There's a lack of innovation especially from the big companies, but certainly, say, even Space Age, circa 18 months ago, we were doing the same stuff everybody else was doing. It's tough to be innovative. It's scary to be innovative. If you're too small, you can't afford to be, and if you're too big, you don't think you can afford to be. And the incumbents are relatively weak at monetization. Uh, it's still a pretty rare art to know how to make money from a free-to-play game, an art that's being perfected in China, to a lesser degree in broader Asia, but not in the West. And lastly, Again, with a few notable exceptions, mobile games haven't built great brands like we've seen in other industries. There are a few, but not many Blizzard or Warcraft type IPs being generated in mobile. So it's all happened so quickly that I find that the, the incumbents are relatively fragile. They're going to do great, but there's still room for somebody willing to be innovative. So whether you are a pessimist in this scenario or an optimist, I think we can all agree the most important thing you need to know about making games is it's really fucking hard. Uh, it's a tractor pull, and what I'm going to offer you are maybe a few tips in each of three categories as to how to spot people who are fighting that fight well and maybe are about to make a hit game. So the categories, product, basically games, people, in other words, the team making them, and lastly, players, folks using them. Uh, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I'm not giving you the hard and fast rules. Some of this clearly will be broken by people who are successful. You can clearly deviate this and still find victory. Uh, this is a great example. You could argue that Minecraft the largest success both in your world and mine in the last five or ten years. You could argue maybe they broke a lot of the rules I'm about to share. And the reason is I think if you want to know the rules to break, you have to know them in the first place. And he did. So first of all, on the product, the game itself. Pretty much all great games run betas. And the longer they run them, often the better. Because they have to learn about the game, learn about the player, make the game better. 
So first rule of thumb, if the game doesn't have a beta, it's probably not going to be big. Within that beta, after they've done their work, they've made the game good, maybe it takes three months, maybe it takes nine, maybe even a year, somewhere in that range, those games should have great stats. <coughs> and the way we think about stats in free-to-play gaming basically are in three buckets. Engagement, uh, the minutes you play a day, the number of sessions you play per day. Retention, so how long you play the game. We measure it D1, D7, D28. This means a player who joined today is playing one, seven, and 28 days from now. And monetization. Basically, for every player I have, I make how many cents a day? Do I make 10 cents a day? Do I make a dollar a day? There are a lot more stats, but this is sort of the quick 101, the quick dirty on how to understand the game stats. I'm going to go through the two most important ones. I'm going to not dwell on uh, an engagement. I think the most important thing for you to learn is in retention and monetization. So on retention, on the left, you've got a graph here. Uh, this is a fall-off curve. The way you read it on the, the uh, y-axis is 80, 60, 40, and 20% respectively. And this is day one, day seven, day 14, and day 28. Caveat, this is for mid-core games. Most of our own data is based on build and battle games like Samurai Siege. Obviously, results may vary. The more casual you get, presumably, the less retention you have. Uh, but the more people play the game. But all those caveats aside, let's, let's buttress the possibility set of things that I think that you should promote or be interested in. Anywhere between good and best ever. And there's an even cooler stat that I'm not going to show on the screen because you're never going to know it in data when you need to make a decision to support a game or not. And that's day 365. So you take this to the next level. How many people are playing the game a whole year later? These numbers are at beta. Uh, common misperception when you start asking game companies what their stats are. These are not the numbers that a three-year-old game has. And these numbers atrophy at every company. They get weaker and weaker over time. But you should be talking, in my opinion, to the, the companies that make the games that you're considering and asking them for these stats. And they should be providing them to you. And you should learn how to measure these. Note that this is for US users, for example. In Indonesia, stats are probably a lot worse. So here's an example on monetization. Again, the same caveat. This is from the uh, Results will be lower for more casual games and perhaps higher for some even more core stuff, like you see in China. So good, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 cents per player per day. So if I have uh, 100 players every day, I should be making basically $20 on them, right? Uh, so that's 20 cents. Great, something more like 50 cents, and amazing, something more like a dollar. To give you a sense, uh, Samurai Siege, good. Probably no better than that when we launched the game. Transformers, Rival Kingdoms, they're starting to push great, but they're not quite there, somewhere in between. And then this dollar guy, it's probably Game of War per day at launch. Uh, I imagine Clash of Clans is somewhere between great and great. So it's a pretty wide swing, uh, swing rather. And then ultimately, all these stats feed something that we call lifetime value. This is basically trying to put a number behind a user. So if you imagine every user has a propensity to stay or leave your game, a propensity to spend or not, and you put a million of them in a bucket, and then you say, I want to measure the value of a user over a whole year, which is a pretty respectable, non-aggressive, non-conservative amount of time to measure, you get the lifetime value. So maybe the lifetime value of a Rival Kingdoms player is $12. That means every user I get, I can expect to make $12 on them over 12 months. And armed with that, I can then say, all right, well, what's it cost me and my marketing crew to buy these users? Is it a dollar? Is it $50? And herein lies effectively why some mobile games are successful in the modern era and some are unsuccessful. Because in order to be successful, you need to acquire users. In order to acquire users, you need to be able to buy them profitably, which means LTV has to be bigger than CPM. You should learn how to measure numbers of game companies if you really want to run the business well, in my opinion. Second big tip on the product, uh, I think great games have one foot in the old and one foot in the new. I don't think that was true three years ago. I think it's certainly true today. Some examples. Uh, the core loop, what you do for the three minutes you're really playing the game. That's old. You've seen it before. But the meta is entirely new and often uh, not seen before in that genre because people played the game on console and maybe didn't play it on mobile and therefore nobody's bothered to make a free-to-play version. Secondly, you see the genre, or what we call the play pattern, sort of the behavior that the game allows a, a user to participate in, doing really well across all of Asia. I want to make a big point on this. If you see it do well in China, but not the rest of Asia, be very skeptical. Likewise for Korea, likewise for Japan. But if something does well across Asia, with those markets being radically different, good bet is if somebody figures out how to make that game for the West, it's going to do really well. And I think that's a huge focus area for ourselves and should be for the market. 
Uh, a third example, tradition of a play pattern doing really well. Everybody played Animal Crossing, for example. We're all excited to see Animal Crossing on a 3DS. Stands to reason when Animal Crossing goes live on mobile, even without the brand, it would do pretty well because they're satisfying something that we're used to, but maybe somebody hasn't cracked the code on for real. So, the main thing, great games have one foot in the old and one foot in the new. Let me give you an example that's very topical. This is Gardenscapes. Don't know if you've heard of it. Somewhere in the neighborhood of Top 30 Grossing, it's a switcher game like King would make. So they had one foot in the old, and then they did something that nobody had done before, at least not in this genre, which is, oh, this story stuff. It's working in Kim Kardashian, it's working in episodes. I bet instead of a saga map, the players might be motivated by a story to play a game like this. Same audience, after all. I don't know how scientific these guys were about it, but my guess is more than you'd think in 2016 to have a success like this. All right, so that's games. Second is team. I'm going to be a little more brief on this one and sort of give you a laundry list of things that I think comprise a good team. But the reason why it's important is at the end of the day, uh, good games are made by great teams. And it can be really hard, increasingly so, to spot a good game. But if you can spot a good team and stick with them for the long haul, then maybe they fail in this game, but they'll probably make the next one successful. So some bullets on what makes a good team. First of all, deep experience. If you look at companies ranging from CCP, to King, to, uh, to any number, Supercell and the like, uh, lots of people in this room as well. You'll notice that they've been making games for 10 or 12 years. A lot of failures under their belt, maybe failures across entire companies, maybe a lot of titles that you didn't like, but they've persisted. And that's a sign that they are learning and that they're persisting and that they're not in it as a pioneer. They're actually here to stay because they like games. So deep experience, decades often. Second, the teams are small. There are some caveats. Asia knows how to make a game with a large group of people, but for the most part, for the West, I'm a big believer that when you see a small team, you're more likely to see a successful team. When you see a large team, you're more likely to see a failed one. And I think we're lucky in mobile that this paradigm is holding true, even when in console there was sort of an arms race to make the teams bigger. And I think the reason is players in mobile games don't need or want that huge high production value game. The kind of thing they need or want actually can be designed by 10 or 12 people. And in 2017, we have the tools available to us to make games with small groups of people. The best example I can give you is Instagram. I think it's worth several billion dollars. It's made by 12 people. And that math wouldn't have existed a decade ago. It can today. Small teams can be more creative. They can be more passionate. They can move more quickly. And these are all good things today. Second, they're hungry. You can have a lot of small teams maybe who have already enjoyed success uh, and have gotten lazy, or maybe they don't really know why they're in it. But in whatever, whatever form you're looking for, you want to see a team that's in it to win. I think that's probably true of YouTubers as well. And you can spot hunger in a room. Team really wants it. Kind of at odds with all of that, uh, what I guess you'd call a humble learning posture. Here's my point. Somebody who is really willing to learn should not fool of themselves. Because if you think you know everything, the reality is you don't, and then you're not going to learn the new stuff. So in games in particular, you want to see people who are both hungry, but also willing to admit that they don't know everything, and in fact, they don't know most things. And that's how people ultimately get better. Next, they're not racing the clock. Uh, racing the clock looks like I've got three months of funding left, and so I need to get this game live, irrespective of whether the beta tells me it's a good product or not. Because that's the wrong reason to launch a game. I know this because we used to be this. Uh, we used to be watching the clock and everything we did at Samurai Siege is basically a giant exercise in a company racing against the clock. And we got away with that. Uh, we got away with that largely because it was 2013. I'm not sure we get away with that today. They really get the game they are making. They're not just making that game because they've heard people like it. So for example, if you see a game that's really targeted at women, made by a bunch of dudes, they're probably going to have a problem, uh, unless they're way more clairvoyant than that. So look for people who have genuine passion around the game they're making, because that's what's going to get them through the long nights, going to get them through the painful parts where it doesn't seem to be working. They actually care. Space Age started as a company that made sports games. Nobody here likes sports. Uh, that's, that's since changed, but for the first 15, I know you laugh that it was started off so August, it's because Sion and I said, there's a hole, sports games. By the way, it's still true today, there's still a huge, giant hole, more people should make sports games. It's just not going to be us. Uh, so there would be another theory, go look for some sports games. <laughs> Lastly, and, and I'd almost argue most importantly in 2017, they really know free to play. I find that this is a skill set extremely lacking in mobile gaming. Uh, first of all, you have to get through a barrier of people who don't even think it's ethical. They don't think it's cool. Games shouldn't be free to play. That's a big problem. I mean, if you don't really think it's ethical, I doubt you're going to do a good job of it. You're probably going to pull your punches. And then, even when you come around to the idea that this is a great way of getting products in the hands of people, 
then it takes years and years of experience. Uh, and this is where China is destroying us, if you compare the West versus China. China fully understands. Hundreds of companies know how to monetize better than the best company here in Europe or the United States. So look for both a willingness to be free to play and look for an aptitude at it. And, and personally, I think if, and again, my, my lesson to you uh, is really about mobile gaming and, and these tips really go away quickly if you want to talk about Steam or VR or something else. But within the context of what I'm talking about, if it's not free to play, I don't think it's going to do well. So that's it on team and lastly on players. This is something you probably know a lot better than I because you're a lot closer to the person playing these games than I. But first of all, and I think it's important you understand this, they don't know what they want. That's an adage that's true of all humans, not just your player. And so you can't just ask them, hey, do you want this kind of game and expect them to say yes. They'll probably say, I'm not sure. On the other hand, they'll know they like it when they see it. So it's one thing to ask them. It's another to put it in their hands. If they don't like it after an hour, that's probably something you can, you can bank on. And they'll keep playing it. For us, we run these user tests all the time. We do user tests through a thing called player research. We do focus groups in the office. We do betas. One of the best litmus tests for if this thing's going to work, a game, is if at the end of the test, they take the device back and they keep playing it. Or they email us the next day, like, hey, dude, can I play that game? That's really what you want to see. You want to see people who have a choice to quit. They're no longer being paid. They're no longer on the clock. And they still want to play the game. And you can figure this out as a YouTuber. And the reason is because there's an increasing availability of early access programs. Steam has an awesome early access program. I think it was the inspiration for Google that now has an early access program. People like us on iOS will sort of create our own early access program. We'll put the game live in, first it was New Zealand and Australia these days, I think with Denmark and the Philippines. But we'll find a small subset of our players uh, to make the game better for everybody else. And because of that fundamental requirement for us to test, that creates an opportunity for you and our competitors to see what we're up to and for us to see what they're up to. So my advice would be to you is to learn from everybody's pains. You can go look at App Annie and dig up stats on how games are doing in New Zealand or the Philippines. You can find player communities on forums. You can talk to them and figure out what's going well and what's going poorly. So this is a freebie. I did this this morning. So some big caveats here. This is New Zealand. This is iOS only, grossing charts. And I filtered it by games that launched in Q4. To me, signs, this is a beta. If you go live in New Zealand in Q4, you're still in beta. An interesting thing, number 5, number 10, number 14, and number 32 grossing are all Chinese or Indonesian or Singaporean made games. So if you go back to what I said at the beginning, monetization is the predominant weakness of game companies in the West. The Asians especially, the Chinese are good at it. And you wanted to bet if my hypothesis were right. This is a smoking gun. So when these games go live, and in general, I think you'll see across 2017 a lot more games that are made in China doing well in the West. Or Western companies getting their act together real fast, making Western versions of those games, but accepting the monetization practices of China. Lastly, here are some red flags. So on the, the contra, this is maybe what not to look for when you consider if the game is going to be big or not. The game's been in development for several years. Again, all rules can be broken, but if you've been working on this thing for a couple of years, and you don't have this, people playing it, it's probably because it's not meant to work. I know for us at Space Ape, one of the lessons we learned in 2016, and I think we continue to learn, is to kill games more often. Because inevitably, you can be a good team but still make a bad product. So we killed two things in Q4, probably should have killed four across 2016 instead of the two. And in general, the quality of our products is going up as, as we develop the wherewithal and the, the guts to kill things, because it leaves only the best games remaining. Because maybe the beta stats suck, or maybe you realize it sucks yourself, or you're just not getting it. But at the end of the day, if people aren't playing it, it's probably not good. The team's unwilling to share stats, especially if they're in beta. It's one thing if they're not, but if they're in beta and they're like, yeah, I don't really know my stats, they're like, yeah, you know your stats. So they should be able to share them. And you can always intuit them if you go to some resources like that, Dan. This one is pretty typical. Big Co says, oh, it's cool. I've got this big brand. I'm going to spend my way to success. Maybe. Uh, but is the company developing that game any good? Does the game monetize and retain? Because there's only so many days, weeks, and months that a big company is willing to burn money. And if the lifetime value of a game is three, but the cost to acquire user is a 10, it doesn't really matter how big the company is. They're not going to do that for long. And I think you see a lot of that in the charts right now. If you compare the grossing charts to actually the profit charts, you get a very different angle. People willing temporarily to spend more than they make because they haven't figured out this math. They don't even know it. On the flip side, Little Co. basically not having a marketing plan and saying, you're the marketing plan. The other classic answer is, ah, my game's awesome. The only reason no one's playing it is because you haven't bragged about it yet. 
So look for companies, certainly most of all mine, give you a better, better marketing plan than just yourself. Are they thinking about users? Have they thought about the brand? Have they thought about how they're going to acquire millions of people, get Apple to feature it, entice alliances of players from similar games to jump over? That's the sort of stuff that's going to be required in 2017 to make a good game. You alone can no longer do it. So to recap, learn the stats, vet the team, listen to the players and data. Some sources for you to do that, App Annie, Sensor Tower, Crunchbase, LinkedIn. With regard to App Annie and Sensor Tower, there's sort of a free version and a paid version. And a lot of developers, I'm one of them, are really reluctant to pay for the expensive stuff. If I were making the kind of money I speculate some of you are making, I would just suck it up and buy this stuff, or I'd get some sort of consortium and I'd do it. Because the kind of data you can get from a paid App Annie or Sensor Tower account about what's doing well in beta might give you an advantage over others. Might let you spot a game that's starting to blow up in the beta markets, but Nobody knows about it. Nobody's reached out to them yet. I think that would be money well spent. It's business development, which is kind of why you're here. Uh, thanks again for joining, and have a great day.